questions. Thank you, Abhijal. Uh, good morning to all and a very warm welcome to today's webinar focusing on the European Union mass leads on viral hepatitis elimination by 2030. My name is Maria Guti, and I am the Public Health Counselor for ISEL, the European Association for the Study of the Liver. ISEL is a medical association that focuses on promoting liver health through scientific and medical research, education, awareness, and advocacy. ISEL is also the Secretariat of the MEP Friends of the Liver Group. I am delighted to be moderating today's webinar, as it aims to build on a previous event held at the European Parliament last October, hosted by the MEP Friends of the Liver Group, where the group issued a call to action for the European Commission and the European Member States to lead on viral hepatitis elimination and to ensure that the W elimination deadline for 2030 will be met. Insights generated during the event informed the call to action, which has been endorsed by several members of the MEP Friends of the Liver Group. Today, at uh, this webinar, it's an opportunity to present the call to action and discuss with with you, with the audience, and three experts in the field. Today, uh, we are connected to uh, 41 people. Uh, participants can interact asking questions or making comments, uh, raising their hands or by the chat after each intervention or at the end during the Q&A session. So, uh, this is the agenda. Uh, first, I would like I would like to introduce the the speakers. Uh, welcome uh, remarks by Miss Mariana Taki. She is the Putty Head of Unit Disease Prevention and Head Promotion Disease Santé at the European Commission. Then I am going to present the liver call to action. And there will be two interventions, one by Dr. Uh, Marieke from the web, head of section for sexually transmitted infections, bloodborne and tuberculosis at European Center for Disease Prevention and Control. And after Dr. Ricardo Baptista Laite, the president and founder of UNITED, uh, the parliamentarian network uh, for uh, global health, will also uh, intervene. And at the end, we will have time for for discussion. So let's start with the welcome uh, remarks. It's uh, my pleasure to introduce you, uh, Ms. Uh, Marianne Taki. Marianne, the floor is yours. Good morning and thank you very much, uh, Maria. Just to check that everyone hears me, seems to be the yes. case. So, um, so good morning uh, and welcome to everyone to this uh, important uh, EU Health Policy Platform webinar. Um, John Ryan was uh, not able to attend this uh, meeting and therefore I stepped in, uh, but he sends his best regards to all of you. Um, this uh, webinar is very important because you will discuss now um, the call for action, the EU must lead on viral hepatitis el elimination by 2030, which is also uh, along the WHO's deadline, uh, and how it will be uh, taken forward. The Commission welcomes this call for action uh, because it is a very concrete outcome of the event hosted by the MEP Friends of the Liver Group in the European Parliament last October. Um, the headline, the final push to eliminate viral hepatitis, how can the EU lead the successful achievement of this global public health priority, is a very good uh, headline for concrete actions. Now, your call uh, links to already um, a number of Commission initiatives, and in particular those that are under the Europe Spitting Cancer Plan, as you may know. In your call, you highlight, for example, call for the EU member states 
to make full use of the forthcoming joint action on cancer and uh, non-communicable diseases prevention, the action focusing on health determinants. You also call on the Commission and the International Agency for Research on Cancer to further take into account the link between hepatitis B and C and cancer in the revision of the European Code Against Cancer. You further call on the Commission to aim for strengthened vaccination of children and risk groups against hepatitis B in uh, our upcoming proposal for a new Council recommendation uh, against vaccine preventable cancers. And I will say a few words about that a little bit later on. And finally, you call on us uh, or the Commission to work on hepatitis related inequalities uh, across Europe through the Cancer Inequalities Registry that has been set up under the Europe uh, Beating Cancer Plan. Now, you, the, the key thing uh, about concrete actions and where the Commission and the Member States have now a good track record is on uh, good practices. And you have called on the Member States and the Commission to work um, on implementing and um, transferring good practices to fight viral hepatitis in the new expert group on public health, which was set up only last year. So you are in fact asking and calling on the Member States, the Commission and the wider range of stakeholders to do more, to build on and expanding on what is already being done. And the Commission appreciates that and that is why we welcome also your call. We already have a number of structures and processes in place that can help us reach together our common goal to eliminate uh, the viral hepatitis as a public threat by 2030. Um, our team uh, in the unit disease prevention and um, uh, health promotion is currently preparing a proposal for a new council recommendation on vaccine preventable cancers. And our colleague Martin Ingorsen, who is here today, is leading that work. The, I, the main focus of that council recommendation is to support member states in increasing the uptake of uh, human papilloma viruses and hepatitis B virus. The consultation period um, with the stakeholders and member states is now over and we are preparing the council recommendation with the other relevant commission services. The proposal for this legal um, act is planned to be adopted by the commission later this year. Um, and then finally, uh, the Commission's new expert group on public health, which was only set up in December, is now discussing and agreeing its work priorities and best practices and promising practices will be based uh, on the priority areas that the Member States will discuss and agree. Those may include viral hepatitis, which is also part of the mandate of this new group. So as you can see, we are already doing um, a number of actions and we can build on these uh, actions also in the future. Today's uh, webinar will us also help um, exploring how we can do this more concretely in practice and with the stakeholder, active stakeholders like yourselves. Um, we will also need to build on our epidemiological uh, information and update on what is the situation in Europe on viral hepatitis and therefore, the uh, European Centre for Disease Prevention and Control, a key partner for us, um, the Commission and uh, Member States uh, in its work on uh, infectious diseases, will provide you an update uh, and the um, state of play of the, such information. So I hope that these um, welcoming remarks, um, we can uh, kick off the meeting and I wish everyone a very uh, productive and interesting webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mariana, for these opening uh, remarks. Uh, is there any burning question or any comment related to the presentation? You can use the, the, the chat for, for questions or, or comments. So I only have a, a comment that for, for us is really important 
is to increase the uptake of hepatitis B vaccination. And I, I think um, this is a really very, very uh, critical for European countries because this vaccine prevents uh, cancer. Uh, do you like to comment a bit more on this or do you think this will be a reality in, in, in the next year? Well, thank you for that question, Marianne. I think it's extremely important uh, issue. Now, of course, I cannot tell how sure we are with that we're going to reach the uh, targets, but this is the aim. And, and the way we do it is we support the member states who have the primary responsibility for the vaccination policies. And therefore, the council recommendation, which will um, be um, adopted by the end of the year will highlight and will include um, call for action to the member states, but also to the um, Commission and other players, uh, agencies and so on, um, to ensure that we can fill in the steps which will lead us towards that goal. So, Maria, the, the call has been heard and we are uh, trying to find the best ways, the most impactful and cost effective ways also uh, with the member states to achieve those goals. And I think the best practice work of the public health expert group will also um, be important to ensure in, in um, to ensure that we can reach all affected populations and those uh, which are most vulnerable and at the high risk. Um, but Thank Martin might, may wish to add on this if uh, if she's um, available. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. So let's move to the main presentation of this webinar that is presenting the MEP friends of the Liber uh, call to action. I would like to summarize the most important points, the most important actions, and if. If I can have the next slide. So, um, the, the, the talking points for this one are the next slide, please. Uh, please. Next one. The, thank you. So, the, the most important points one, it's as Marianne has mentioned, it's uh, sharing good practices. A uh, group uh, sharing. Uh, Good practices is a key element of the call to action to eliminate viral hepatitis in Europe. And the MEP Friends of the Liver call on the European Commission new EU member state expert group to quick, quickly start the selection of good practice and how to use this best practice to fight viral hepatitis. Uh, during this uh, session at the European Parliament on October 25, a chief coalition uh, presented uh, the stories to inspire a collection of good practice. And I think this is important to, to discuss in this uh, forum. And this can be used in, in, in different countries uh, to, to share the best practice for viral hepatitis elimination that are mainly focused in vulnerable population. Our, regarding good practices, we praise to the European Commission for having set a new group, as Mariana has mentioned, the Public Health Expert Group, with official representative of ministers of health uh, to identify best practice and to discuss its rollouts also together with communicable disease, including viral hepatitis. We think that viral hepatitis should be included at the same level that HIV and other infectious diseases that usually uh, more attention is paid. We would like to call on member states of the Europe and the European Commission to use this new group and make viral hepatitis one of the priorities of the group's uh, work program. Europe is not on the right track to achieve elimination of viral hepatitis, viral hepatitis B and C. Some countries are on track, but the majority of European countries are not on track and learning from each other, particularly for those who are on 
uh, uh, those countries that are in track of, of viral hepatitis elimination could be useful and more cooperation is needed. We also call on national stakeholders to advocate vis-a-vis -vis the health ministers for a discussion on the best practice sharing to support viral hepatitis elimination in the public health expert group. A second point that for us is also important is funding and data uh, generation. And you are going to see later in the presentation of European CDC that we need more data. Funding for data and data uh, generation, it's another important point. And we call on the European Commission to ensure that the EU4 health funds are used in accordance with the project description of the Joint Action on Cancer Prevention and Health Determinant, which explicitly mentioned viral hepatitis detection and treatment. So we need to have more efforts in viral hepatitis detection and treatment and, and, the, and the both foundings to this action. With the joint action on cancer and non-communicable prevention in the UE for Health 2022, the European Commission has made 78 million euros available for member states to address health determinants that can lead to cancer and other non-communicable disease. And the European Commission has included better detection and better treatment and prevention of viral hepatitis in the list of health determinants. This is important because uh, viral hepatitis is included at the same level with more established determinants as tobacco, harmful alcohol and nutrition. So therefore, we call on member states to use part of the funds from the joint action to improve viral hepatitis a detection, linkage, and linkage to care. We also call to, to the European Commission in the future, and uh, not in, only in the current, also in the future uh, health programs to continue to support prevention, avoid reinfection, um, improve diagnosis and linkage to care for those in need. And these uh, is, are mainly uh, these groups, uh, vulnerable populations such as migrants, people who inject drugs, and um, um, prisoners. Many of them still don't have access to treatment due to a lack of health coverage. And we would like to point to the fact that there are also indications that there are um, still, um, that there are remain also for general population. There are people infected with viral hepatitis that are not defined in these uh, vulnerable populations and they are still waiting for diagnosis. So we need to help all of them if we want to achieve the goal of WHO, viral hepatitis elimination. The third point that has also been mentioned in the opening remarks is the European Betting Cancer Plan. And we praise that European Commission for having recognized viral hepatitis B and C as a preventable cancer risk factor in European betting cancer plan. This is really important because um, the majority of liver cancers worldwide are related to viral hepatitis B and, and C. So the recognition in, in, in the European betting cancer plan is extremely important. We would like to highlight that this is not still uh, very well understood, even for many cancer experts, that we need to devote more efforts to recognize viral hepatitis, uh, the linkage between viral hepatitis and liver cancer. And we point to the need for the European Commission to continue to inform about this. An example is the, the updated European Code Against Cancer must not only encourage shield, shieldhood vaccination 
against hepatitis B. Also, in, must inform on viral hepatitis transmission, particularly the different routes of transmission, sexual transmission, and the need to get tested if one has been exposed to a risk of infection. There are many people who are not part of, as I mentioned before, of these defined risk groups. So the European Code Against Cancer presents an opportunity to inform uh, these people. Another important uh, point is uh, the future of cancer inequality register needs to inform also about hepatitis related inequality, inequalities, which can lead to inequalities, not only in diagnosis and treatment, also in, 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 in liver cancer. It's, it's important to make visible uh, these inequities because it's the only way to, to fight or to fight about this. We praise the European Commission for its plans to put forward a council recommendation on vaccine preventable cancers and highlight the importance of closing the vaccination gap for children for hepatitis B. Only, and I think this will be mentioned later, only half of the countries that reported to uh, ECDC have reached the 95 coverage ta target. And, and uh, regarding uh, this, uh, we call all member states to adopt and implement the council recommendations, the council recommendations that highlights the importance to address adult risk groups, such as people who inject drugs and men who have sex with men, but also healthcare professionals and pregnant uh, women. And finally, the last point is global uh, health and interaction, uh, international, uh, sorry, international uh, cooperation. Uh, in the global health strategy uh, that clearly um, looks for improved uh, health care and increased universal health coverage, this is important not only for uh, viral hepatitis, it's important for the, for the uh, global, global health. And we like to express our disappointment that the new global health strategy uh, mentioned HIV, uh, tuberculosis, but doesn't, that does not mention viral hepatitis. And we think viral hepatitis has to be at the same level that HIV and tuberculosis, because it's an important cause of morbidity and mortality. Very important is integration, integration of viral hepatitis in the global and regional funding programs and initiatives. Um, and just uh, to remind that we have a very effective vaccine for hepatitis B, and we don't have a vaccine for hepatitis C, but treatment as prevention works very, very well for uh, hepatitis C. So, uh, finally, uh, we must ensure universal access to prevention, diagnosis, and therapy for viral hepatitis B and C across the European uh, Union. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. We can discuss, if you like, uh, later uh, this uh, call to action or, uh, or perhaps uh, uh, Dr. von der Weer uh, will share uh, some comments about this, uh, her perspective, before uh, her uh, given uh, her talk. Okay. Maria, do you like to comment or do you prefer go directly to, to your talk and I introduce your talk? Yeah, I think I'm my, in my presentation, um, uh, I aim to provide basically the data that support this call for action uh, where we have data because we don't have data for all points. So I think that would be the support for the call for action um, and uh, the best thing to, to do. 
Very, very good. So it's time now. It's your turn. Uh, Dr. Marieke von der Werf, Head of Section for Sexual Transmitted Infection, Bloodborne Viruses and Tuberculosis at European Center for Disease Prevention and Control. We talk about shining a light on the silent epidemic, current landscape of viral hepatitis in the European Union. Thank you very much. Maria. Thank you, Maria, and thank you for organizing, uh, for inviting ECDC. Um, I've, as I said, I will present some data that we have at ECDC, and I must acknowledge that my colleague uh, Erika Dufel, who is the principal expert on hepatitis at ECDC, prepared the slides that you will see. So um, I'll start with giving some key epidemiological features of hepatitis, both B and C, and I'll show you that there is a high burden of chronic hepatitis B and C, but also that there is a lot of variation between the member states. And then I'll have some information on uh, the high prevalences in some key populations, and that will be mainly be migrants, men who have sex with men, people who inject drugs, and people in prisons. So first, looking at the overall data, and um, we, we have estimates from systematic reviews combining all, uh, combined with all other data that we have. And for hepatitis B, uh, we think that 3.6 million people are living with chronic hepatitis B in the EU EEA. For hepatitis C, the estimate is, is a bit lower, but it's a preliminary estimate, and there we think it's 1.8 million people, which comes to a total of 5.4 million people living with either hepatitis B or hepatitis C. This slide shows you the variation between the member states, um, and if you see a darker color, it means that there's a higher prevalence of hepatitis B or C. And both slides, ba slides basically give the conclusion that there's a huge variation between member states, um, that the, the higher prevalences are to be found in more the south and the east of the EU EEA. But also it shows that for quite a number of uh, member states, we actually do not have an estimate. If we look at the key populations, and then first for hepatitis B, and these are data that come from systematic reviews, but also from EMCDDA, uh, then we see that for hepatitis B, the highest prevalences are found in migrant populations, and it goes up to 32% of the migrant population being infected. Uh, but also people who inject drugs have been shown to have high prevalences of hepatitis B. But please notice that the interval is really wide. So depending on the study and the specific migrant or other population, uh, it's a lower or a higher prevalence. Um, for hepatitis C, the estimated uh, prevalences are even higher, and uh, the highest ones are found in people who inject drugs, where it goes up to almost 100% of the study population being infected. Um, and for people in prison, it goes up to 83%. But also here, and even here, it's even uh, more apparent. The intervals are really wide. So, it, it, depending on which specific uh, population of people who inject drugs or people in prisons you study. Uh, then uh, these are some indicators that we measure to assess progress towards WHO elimination targets. And the first two ones are on HPV vaccination, which has been discussed already by the two previous speakers. Um, if we look at uh, the percentage of uh, people who receive three doses of HPV, HPV vaccine, we see that 22 countries are reporting. And of those, 11 have reached a target of 90, 95% coverage. Uh, there are still a few uh, member states who have uh, birth dose uh, for hepatitis B vaccination. And uh, there we have actually five countries have it, and four of those reached a target of 90% coverage. Looking at uh, antenatal screening for hepatitis B, uh, there are 13 countries reporting on uh, their antenatal screening coverage, and 10 of them reached a 90% coverage. 
And then if we look at the coverage of post-exposure prophylaxis of infants who are born to hepatitis B infected mothers, then we see that six countries are reporting on this indicator and five of them reach the 95% coverage. For uh, blood safety, the situation is actually quite good. First of all, we have uh, 22 countries reporting on this and only one reached and the target of 90% of the blood donate donations being voluntary. For harm reduction uh, activities, we have uh, 14 member states reporting and these data are from EMCDDA. And of the 14, uh, three reached the targets of providing more than 200 syringes per person who injects drugs per year. And nine of the 14 reached the, the target of 40% of the opioid dependent uh, period receiving uh, opioid substitution treatment. So um, these are some of the elimination targets. Next, or the next slide I need to do myself. Looking uh, first at progress towards the diagnostic targets, um, then the number of countries that report data on this is limited. It's eight for hepatitis B and seven for hepatitis C. And for hepatitis B, four of these eight reach the target of 50% of people living with chronic hepatitis B infection being diagnosed. Dosed. Um, and uh, four of the seven countries reporting data on hepatitis C achieved the WHI O target of 50% of people living with chronic hepatitis C infection being diagnosed. And the next slide is on the treatment targets. And I'm actually, I'm not even going to mention them. I just want to mention that for hepatitis B, three, one, and three uh, member states reported. And for hepatitis C, this is a bit better. We have eight member states reporting on treatment, but then you see that the percentage of diagnosed cases uh, put on treatment in 2020 is low. The only good news is that, but that we know that those who are put on treatment have a good sustained virological uh, viral response. And that's based on data from 10 countries. So what can we conclude from these data um, and which is also covered by the call for action that there's still a major need for better information for action. We need more countries to report better data. Uh, there's also an urgent need for further scale up of diagnosis and linkage to care. Uh, we have patchy uh, data on implementation of prevention services, so this really needs to be improved. And there are inequities related uh, to services for vulnerable populations. Uh, this is not for you to read, but just to acknowledge all the people who did provide data to ECDC. And we're very thankful for that. And we hope uh, more people can join this list. And if you want more information, you can find it either on the ECDC website uh, or you can email us at sbtecdc.europe.eu. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, um, Maria, for the, the excellent uh, intervention. Uh, if there is any question or comment related to the presentation, please send them to everyone in, in the chat. Uh, I have a, a question uh, for for you. Clearly, we need to provide more more data, and and particularly data of quality. So how to increase uh, the, the data. So how to, to, to ask um, countries that provide more data that I think we need to be different, more innovative, because in this classical way, the data that we at least have are, are, are very scarce. Yeah, it's it's an effort, of course, of the member states who have the data, but uh, at ECDC, we're implementing several projects with the member states to get better and different data. And so just to mention um, two of them, one is that we support the member states in conducting hepatitis C prevalence surveys. So to really see what the prevalence of hepatitis C is in this general population. And two countries are already embarking on such studies, but we hope, of course, that more countries will join this effort. 
And um, we will also start this year with uh, setting up sentinel surveillance for hepatitis uh, to get better data, but then from other sources than the, the classical surveillance, uh, case-based surveillance. So these are just two examples where we try to get, in, using other means, better and different data that will support us giving a, a good picture of how the situation is. Thank you. So let's move to the last uh, presentation. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Uh, Ricardo Baptista Leite, a public health expert and founding uh, president of United uh, Parliamentarians Network for Global Health. And he's going to talk about uh, his experience as a former national policymaker in the UA, EU member state, as well as a president of this uh, global network of policymakers. Oh, hello, and uh, good morning, everyone. I hope you can hear me well. It's a great pleasure. Yes, <laughs> it's a great pleasure to be with all of you, and I, I congratulate you on what has actually been a very interesting uh, conjunction of uh, presentations. Today is a very special day for us here in Portugal. I'm currently in the parliament because in a, in a few minutes I have to go into a ceremony that will be celebrating the 49th anniversary of the Carnation Revolution that freed Portugal from a fascist dictatorship into freedom and democracy. And that is why I'm also uh, presenting the Ukrainian flag in the defense of the freedom of these people, of the people of Ukraine who have been invaded by the Russian Federation. And I wanted to uh, thank you for this because the truth is freedom and democracy are, have to be built in parallel with access to health. Uh, the truth is uh, it was through the democratic process here in Portugal that universal health coverage started to become a reality. And this is a critical element uh, that must be discussed par as part of this larger discussion because universal health coverage is only a reality if it reaches everyone. And as we've seen here, it is particularly those that live so many times at the margins of societies, such as uh, those who are currently in prisons or people who inject drugs that are many times the, the main victims of viral hepatitis. I started my career as a medical doctor trained in infectious diseases, and I saw that firsthand. And it was a transformative time in my personal life to see how um, so many people are absolutely forgotten by the formal institutions of health. And as we just saw from a brilliant presentation from ECDC, um, there is so much more that needs to be done. And of course, we need to use innovative approaches and technologies, but I'll get to that in a second. I'm here today, as Maria well put, as the founder and president of UNITE, a global network of current and former policymakers, members of parliaments, congresses, and senates, uh, who have come together to fight for global health. Under our partnership agreement with the World Health Organization, we work uh, in three pillars. One is access to health and human health as a human right. So universal health coverage falls into that, into that space. When also strengthening, our second pillar is strengthening of health systems. And so this also includes the digitization of health systems. And finally, health emergency response, which includes a lot of our work when it comes to the pandemic accord and to uh, uh, making sure that we are better prepared for future uh, health emergencies, both in terms of prevention and in terms of response. And within our network, we have uh, followed very closely uh, the work that uh, both EASL and the Achieve Coalition have been doing, which we endorse and we continue to be fully available through our secretariat and through our network to support. Because we all know that uh, the sustainable development goals included uh, uh, within, within their indicator 3.3 that by 2030, uh, we need to end the epidemics of AIDS, tuberculosis, malaria, and neglected tropical diseases, and combat hepatitis, waterborne disease, and other communicable diseases. Well, the truth is, uh, we, and under the WHO action plan that was approved um, 
we we as, we we took the issue of elimination of hep, viral hepatitis as a goal uh, for as part of the goal for the 2030 agenda, ending uh, or eliminating viral hepatitis as a public health threat, uh, and also part of our European and integrated within the global strategies. And uh, the global elimination targets for 2030, uh, we know, are twofold, a reduction in incidence of chronic infections by 90%, an association mortality of 65%, and ensuring equitable access to comprehensive prevention and recommended testing care and treatment services for all. However, we are extremely far from reaching these targets. And as was said here before, um, in, other, in many contexts, we don't even know if we're reaching those targets because we don't have the data and the needed information. And uh, once again, we, we see that within the evidence that has been provided that uh, it, it, there are parts of the population that are particularly uh, difficult sometimes for formal institutions to reach. And that's why we need to work more with patient advocates, with NGOs, with those that actually work on the ground that are close to the people living with the, uh, the conditions that we are discussing to make sure that we're able to reach them. It, it's not enough just to listen to patients. We need to include patients in the decision process. We need to make sure that patients are included when it comes to the financing of solutions, both in terms of screening, in terms of diagnostics, in terms of treatment, uh, in terms of follow-up, in terms of advocacy and awareness building. We many times do not have these elements all in place uh, across our European region. And so we need to work more, of course, uh, on all of these aspects. And uh, UNITE has been very focused in uh, working with our members and the partners uh, towards uh, discussing the, the, the advantages of vaccination and the need for better screening and then access to, to treatment. Um, we also, um, uh, of course, play a very important role when it comes to uh, legislation as members of parliaments. Uh, we uh, have this role of being able to pass laws, pass policies, but also make sure that governments are accountable to their commitments and governments have signed on to the sustainable development goals. And therefore, it is our role to uh, speak to power, if we will, and to make sure that governments keep their word to the people. And when we're not doing our job properly, please, as citizens, as institutions, reach out to us so we can speak with the members of parliaments, congresses and senates from your own countries so that we can advocate also by your side, so that we can work together. At UNITE, we have seen amazing situations where elected representatives didn't even know of the existence of certain advocate groups of certain realities. And uh, mind you, parliamentarians and members of governments have so many different issues on their plate. If there's no one speaking upon certain aspects of society, particularly those that affect communities that are sometimes less vocal for, uh, due to their situation and conditions of vulnerability or others, well, those are the ones that we as, uh, as global health activists, as politicians, as academics, as patient advocates, as, uh, as institutional leaders, we all must come together and, and make sure that those voices are heard. We also play an important role as parliamentarians when it comes to budget oversight, and we are the ones passing budget, not only in terms of our national budgets, but also, well, through our national budgets, also in terms of funding European and multilateral organizations. And therefore, it is critical to have an active voice in your parliament to make sure that the needed funding is made available and of course advocacy with the communities this is an, an an aspect that i have already mentioned that i think is extremely critical and i there i'd like to share an example for uh, where within our our network just uh, recently uh, in uh, on world help hepatitis day in 2022 in ecuador uh, one of our uh, most active members 
uh, there, uh, who is a member of parliament, uh, Maria Jose Plaza, who is also the chair of the health committee in the parliament of Ecuador, invited members of parliament from around the world, but also academics and civil society members, uh, in, including from our partners at the World Hepatitis Alliance, to provide technical briefings at the health committee. Uh, and this has allowed Ecuador to take very important steps forward. So this is the critical element. After everything we have heard that UNITE can contribute, I believe, which is creating this bridge between different actors, policymakers, academ uh, academia, researchers, affected communities, civil society, and international organizations with the aim of transforming and translating scientific evidence and transforming scientific recommendations into informed concrete laws and policies and budgets at both global, regional, and national levels. And doing this also through this international experience, shared experience and a peer peer to peer approach where parliamentarians speak to each other. Sometimes within the same country, we're able to bring parliamentarians from different parties together, but also from different countries and a peer to peer approach and experience sharing best practice sharing approach has been very effective. And we need to make sure that we include viral hepatitis elimination in a broader global health agenda, which is sometimes very difficult. And we have seen when uh, a cure for hepatitis C uh, was uh, presented to the world, uh, there was a lot of discussions for many reasons that we know, uh, pricing included. But the truth is it rose the profile of viral hepatitis, which has been lost over the years. And we need to continue the fight of making sure that screening vaccination and treatment is available, not just for hep C, but for all viral uh, hepatitis. And um, we uh, at UNITE have created at, at the European level in the European Parliament an informal group of MEPs focusing on HIV. There is naturally potential to expand the mandate and the members are very open to discussing uh, uh, the issues that UNITE has presented to them. So here is an opportunity along with EASL and the Chief Coalition to do more. UNITE also collaborates with the Subcommittee on Public Health at the European Parliament and uh, therefore all of these agendas can be brought forward uh, in these platforms for a broader inclusion in uh, the European Union health policies, along with all of the work that we already do uh, within our secretariat through our drug policy desk, focusing on particular issues of drug policy and harm reduction, but uh, much broader than the many aspects that we have heard today. Uh, the challenges are tremendous and uh, we, we do have uh, very ambitious goals for 2030, but that's what's also part of our daily work. That's what makes it exciting. It's that possibility of actually being able to save lives. And uh, this is what uh, I'm sure wakes up, up everyone who is on this call today. And it, uh, I want you to know that you can count on me and you can count on UNITE to support you in um, moving this agenda forward. And please count on uh, our network of parliamentarians, current and former members of parliaments, congresses and senates to make sure that your action plan, uh, that your call to action that was presented here today can become a reality. Thank you, Maria. Uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Ricardo. Um, I have a question for, for you. As a former policy maker, and, and you are now doing a great uh, job in, in UNITE, uh, I think it's really important to link HIV and viral hepatitis. I cannot understand uh, this uh, segregation between uh, two infectious diseases that uh, sometimes have the same uh, vulnerable population, why not to work together on this and have different microelimination programs for HIV and others for hepatitis C and others for hepatitis B? I think it's time to, to work together and put in the same basket all of, all of these uh, infectious diseases. What is your opinion, Ricardo? Well, uh, just a minor uh, correction, Maria. I'm still a member of parliament. I'm leaving in uh, on May 22nd. <laughs> Uh, but uh, just for people to understand, uh, because we had discussed this, um, I, I will be leaving, I will be suspending my seat because I have accepted a new role in Geneva as the new CEO of the IDARE, 
the International Digital Health and Artificial Intelligence for Health uh, Research Collaborative. And also through the application of technologies, I'm sure we're going to be able to work many of these issues. Also feel free to reach out to me uh, on those issues. But you are absolutely right, Maria. And most recommendations actually go exactly in the direction you have shown for many reasons. First of all, because many of the affected communities overlap. Second of all, because we live in a time of limited resources, and the truth is there are many opportunities that when we address in a vertical approach, we are losing opportunities for to address other uh, important challenges. And thirdly, because of the awareness campaigns, I mean, we need to make sure that people have a, a, a holistic vision when it comes to their own health. And if we have verticalized approaches, we will be losing resources that could be multiplied and have be much more impactful. And that is why I was saying that uh, although we do have this special group that was created, there is a need in my perception to um, widen its mandate so that we can address many of these issues. Even at UNITE, we started in 2017 as the UNITE Parliamentarians Network to End Infectious Diseases as a Global Health Threat. And with our work with uh, organizations like, such as WHO, we have evolved to becoming the Parliamentarians Network for Global Health because we need to understand, and I think that if there was any doubt, the pandemic has shown us that health has, is a fully integrated uh, um, a challenge that we need to address if we want to make sure that everyone has access to the health that they need. And this, of course, then would lead us to the discussion around also One Health and uh, the integration of human, animal, and uh, health and, eco and the ecology, and all of these different uh, components that, of, at the end of the day, will lead us to universal health coverage. If we continue to look at viral hepatitis as a silo, I, I, I feel that many of those, particularly in most vulnerable situations, will be left behind. And so uh, I couldn't agree more, and we need to work more together addressing precisely that, because there are many parts of the world where there is still a very verticalized approach within the ministries of health and governments. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ricardo, and congratulations, and please go to celebrate the democracy in, in, in Portugal. So with with us uh, there is also Julio Gallo and Martin Inborsen from DG Sante, the European Commission. Uh, I I am wondering if, if they like to make some comment. Julio, Martin. Are you connected? Yes, yes, uh, thank you very much. Thank you for giving me the floor. Well, I, 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 this is not my field of work, but uh, I think it is very, very important. And uh, I, uh, I manage the health policy platform. That's why I'm online. And it's very important that we, we talk together. I mean, the stakeholders, the commission and uh, the, the member of uh, the parliament, I think, uh, because we, we need to achieve common goals. And it was very interesting and very, very useful for me to understand a lot of things. And you are completely right. I think we cannot work in a box or let's say we, we need to have synergy between disease who, are, who have a similar, let's say, targeted population or vulnerable population. And for sure, I think in the future, we will go to this orientation. And I saw also, let's say that uh, we have a big problem in terms of surveillance of this kind of disease. And uh, there was also some suggestion in the chat. I was reading in the chat. It was very interesting to see that uh, uh, there is, let's say, some good practice also in Europe, in Ireland, for instance, was written that there is a very, a, a very good uh, practice for the uh, surveillance of uh, this disease. And I fully agree that we should make an effort, let's say, not to reinvent the wheels, but to use I mean, solution who are already working in some member states and uh, not only to learn about this, but also to make an extra effort to upscale, let's say, this practice to other places. So I think this was very informative for us and we will take home this, 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 uh, this, uh, the, 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 the conclusion of this meeting. And we hope that we did, this was not, let's say, one slot opportunity to talk about this argument. And we are here, let's say, also to support for the actions or for the webinar or meetings, let's say, around the argument, if you feel it interested. And thank you very much for your attention. Over. 
Thank you. Thank you, Julio, for your comments. And, and I think the, the last uh, words uh, are for uh, Martin. Martin yes. has raised Hello, can you hear me? Hand. Can you hear me now? Not very well. Can you see me? So, so. Can you hear me a little bit? Yes, yes. Okay. No, I'm not going to, to say a lot because Marianne already introduced uh, this, this event and, and she said what, what should be said from Commission side. But again, I mean, I would also very much agree with the last speaker and also with Julio that, of course, we should not work in silos. Um, but actually, I think we are doing quite a lot of work to not work in silos. Uh, for instance, when we work on, on uh, with a holistic view on, on infectious diseases and vaccination. I mean, I, I mostly work on vaccination myself, and this is also why I'm leading on this council recommendation on vaccine preventable cancers. I mean, for, for hepatitis B, which is a bit the field that, that I'm working mostly on right now. I mean, I, I could maybe say for the whole viral uh, hepatitis area that, that this has also been mentioned that data reliable uh, data is really important to inform interventions. I mean, all interventions will have to be data driven. Uh, and, and this is a, a, an issue that we need to deal with because the, the collection of data in, in member states is, is quite uh, fragmented, in particular when it comes not so much, and, and um, this is also something that, that ECDC can support on perhaps, but not, not so much for infants, but when, when it comes to vulnerable groups, there are, or at risk group, whatever we call them, there are data gaps indeed. Um, so this is one thing. Uh, then I would also like to say that, that in terms of vaccination, uh, and also on hepatitis B vaccination, of course, I mean, we, we're trying to shift a bit the focus away from perceptions of vaccination to how we can increase the access to vaccination. And, and this is also important, of course, for at, for at risk groups, because we, 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 we need to, to meet people where they are. Uh, I could perhaps perhaps also mention um, uh, a project that, that you may know about or even be involved in, which is called RISOAC that we have at EU level, which are working on uh, how to reach uh, inmates in prisons with vaccination and, and actually also the staff there. Uh, simply, it, it's not great to be imprisoned, but, but this phase of life or, or whatever we call it can also be a privileged uh, way of reaching people. Um, so, so, so we're really trying to work on access uh, instead of just working on perceptions and, and, and levels of trust, even though these are, of course, also important. So, so that would be my, um, my five cents here. But of course, I know it's quite vaccination uh, focused, but this is, this is what I'm working on uh, mostly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. To for showing the, the opportunities, even sometimes in, 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 in bad situations. So I think it's time to, to conclude. On behalf of a chief coalition, uh, I would like to thank all, all the speakers for the excellent talks. And I think it's uh, we have emphasized in, in, in this uh, webinar the importance of collaboration, of collaboration between EU and national uh, levels in achieving viral hepatitis elimination. And clearly, we need collaboration to generate data, to generate funding, and then uh, we need to increase our warners, uh, continuous uh, with uh, the best practices that all, all of this will think will help to, to push for viral hepatitis elimination. Uh, thank you very much and have a very nice day. Thank you all. Thank you for participating. Bye. Bye bye. Thank, thank you. you. Bye bye.